I also want to, before we even start, thank Lucianne and Matt for sharing their deepest, darkest secrets with us. Um, I hope that you had a chance to see Matt's show, which is quite astounding. Um, and there's another sort of level layer to the show that um, is a bit more narrative that I think will come through during their conversation. Um, so it should help inform everyone a little bit more. And, and then afterwards, we can take another look around, see if you see it any differently, and head up to the roof and um, enjoy the stars. <laughs> it is a very good star day. <laughs> yeah. Right, science? One, one star just set. <laughs> True. Um, the sun is a star. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so on that note, Let's start with Matt. Can you tell us a little bit about your show and your pieces? Sure. So Jess asked me if I wanted to do a solo show here, and I said yes. And then after saying no, and then I said yes. And then I had a certain amount of time to finish a bunch of things based off some ideas that I had. And to go to the underlying thing that you mentioned earlier, minutes ago, just minutes ago, um, I, you have to kind of like, when you're making abstract paintings and you're not a real believer in abstract paintings, you need to like have this idea of why you're doing this. So I started inventing this spaceman guy, who you'll see standing around, who has this helmet on. Uh, and that's a helmet that I had shipped to my mom upstate, and my mom took all the photos of me wearing the space helmet. Uh, she's very proud of her ability as a photographer. So the idea is that all of these paintings like, I had to have excuses to make abstract paintings, right? You can't just do it. I don't, I don't really believe in that so much. And so all of these things relate to his travels throughout a universe. And these against the wall are the planetary paintings. And they're supposed to be his, like, views from his, his ship or maybe what his uh, class four probes are checking out or whatever, and data that's being received, and what the surfaces of things look like. But I also, I really like the macro and the micro, so I wanted to sort of like be vague as to whether or not it was maybe something that was actually going on internal, internally. Uh, my friend Eric might know something about things that go on internally uh, that have to do with uh, maybe colors and lights changing and shifting as you experience space. Maybe. Um, and so, so they're like fact and fiction simultaneously. And the same thing with these, uh, so this is supposed to be like looking out of a, you know, in space, right? So you're looking out of your ship or your wherever, or he's looking out of his ship or wherever, and he's documenting these things, or maybe he's actually making them himself or whatever. Or maybe it's a Petri dish. All sorts of places to go with them. And then uh, I started making these guys and I was really excited about making these backgrounds for these other types of paintings that I was making. And then I realized that these paintings were really good just the way they were, especially once I put the resin over the top of them. But it doesn't really fit with anything else that I do. So I realized that our space friend probably needed some like R&R &R and some downtime while he's traveling throughout the universe. And that these are the paintings that he really likes to make. And that allowed <laughs> me to make them. <laughs> um, and he's a humongous fan of Manet, so they're like titled like Picnic on the Grass or like the, mu the Musician Something Something, uh, based off Manet he's paintings. Like in the Tuileries. Yeah, yeah, that was a really important word that I can never remember. Um, and then the cutouts are supposed to like direct you around the entire space, so they like break up your line of sight. Like I can't look at that whatever, whatever on the Tuileries uh, because there's four swords coming out of a hand in front of it, so if I really wanted to see it, I'd have to move around. But I'm probably already thinking about swords as I'm walking around. And it's really all supposed to like be pretty playful about pretty serious things that I think we probably all think about all the time. And I think that's where Lucien came in, because a lot of these serious things that have like a scientific meaning to them, she works with on a daily basis and knows a lot about, more than the average person. So can you tell us a bit about what you do and your work with NASA and how you and Matt came to partner on this? Yeah, sure. Um, so 
I don't know if everybody thinks about this stuff all the time, but I can say that I do. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so I, uh, I do research. Um, I work at Princeton mostly, and I work mostly with a mission called Kepler. Uh, Kepler is a NASA mission that is in space. Um, it's in what we call Earth trailing orbit, which means that it kind of follows Earth's orbit around the sun. And Kepler's job is to look for planets around other stars, so very much in tune with um, the kinds of uh, landscapes that are coming out of Matt's work here. Um, so what Kepler does is, because we don't have access to actually being able to image any of these planets, um, you know, it's actually extremely difficult to even see the surfaces of stars, um, except for our own sun. What we do is we measure the light from um, the stars that are in this one little patch of sky, a patch of sky that's about as big as your hand held up at arm's length. So, you know, relative to the whole sky, it's actually a pretty small patch. <laughs> um, and what we do is we look at the brightness of the stars. We measure them very, very carefully uh, for around like 160,000 of them um, in this one patch of sky. And what we're looking for is for these planets to pass in front of their stars as they orbit around and just block out a tiny little bit of light. And that causes the star to get dimmer for just a couple of hours. And so we look for these planets to pass in front of their star, and we look for them to do it again and again, because if it is a planet, it will orbit around and it will repeatedly block some of that light. So really what we do is we look for planets in this very uh, indirect way, um, where we you know, don't have access to what they actually look like, even though you know, when you see like, stories about planetary discoveries in the news, they always have like a conception of what the planet looks like, but we can't actually access that. Um, so we observe the stars to be able to do that. And the stars themselves actually also change their light all the time. Um, much like our sun, they have these huge spots over their surface that make them get brighter and darker with time, and they spin around. And um, All of that stuff that we can observe about the sun also tells us about whether those planets might be good for life or not. Um, so many people who you know, study planets or look for planets around their stars are motivated by trying to study life in the universe and actually one day detect life on other planets. Um, but at the moment, what we can do is study the stars themselves and see you know, how much light they cast on these planets, um, whether that light changes, whether they sort of fry these planetary surfaces with big like flares and high energy showers of things. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically what I do is I use the data from Kepler. Um, you know, I don't have to stay up all night or anything like that because Kepler's in space, so just downlinks the data is very convenient. Um, and uh, I go through it and I try to study the stars to understand how they affect the life that might be on these planets that we're finding. 